Okay. All right. So this is. Um, I'll try and be as quick as I can, but I might go over <clears throat> half an hour. Um, this is a talk about actually talk about dialectical materialism, but it's, I don't mention dialectical materialism at any point in the talk. But that's what it's about essentially, or at least the beginnings of dialectical materialism. Anyway, let's begin. So any particular thing uh, is what it is and is not what it isn't. So, for example, a seed is, isn't a plant, but things change all the time. Seeds become plants. But how can something that is what it is become what it isn't? And that seems actually not too difficult to answer because a seed is a machine with parts. The parts move, they assemble molecular inputs from the environment, and then it grows into, into new parts. The seed grows into a plant. And in fact, once you start thinking about it, change ultimately involves some kind of motion. So if we can explain how motion is possible, then we'll have gone some way towards explaining how change is possible. So that's what I'm going to try to do. So Zeno, born around 490 BC in the ancient city of Elia, located in modern-day Italy, he argued that motion is impossible. And his arguments are perhaps the most successful of all time because people still discuss them over 2,000 years later, including us. So here I'll focus on just one of his arguments. It's called the paradox of the arrow. And you've got to listen carefully because it's really short if you haven't heard it before. So consider an arrow as it flies through the air. At every instant of time during its flight, it occupies a location equal to its own shape. And in this instant... The arrow is not moving to where it is, because it's already there, and it's not moving to where it's not, because it is where it is. Now, this is true for all the instants of time. So in every instant, the arrow is not moving. And in consequence, the arrow is always motionless during its motion. But that's a logical contradiction, and therefore... Contrary to appearances, motion is impossible. And that's Zeno's paradox of the arrow. And it's a beautifully simple argument. But it's obviously very counterintuitive, and so there must be something wrong with it. And you're probably thinking of some counter-arguments already. So I'm just going to take a few minutes to discuss some of the more well-known responses. And probably the first response was given by uh, Diogenes, Diogenes the Cynic, after hearing Zeno's argument, he said nothing. He simply stood up and walked. <laughs> and we don't know how Zeno reacted because his, his ideas actually appear only as short fragments quoted by later writers, so we'll have to use our imagination. But Zeno might have said, obviously things appear to move, but that appearance, as my paradox demonstrates, is logically contradictory and therefore an illusion. The question is whether things truly move, and if they do, how? So Diogenes may have got a laugh, but he still needed to explain how his walking was logically possible. A different response is to concede that no motion occurs at instants of time, but that, but that motion happens between the gaps of every instant. But Zeno would reply, the gaps themselves are filled with more instants of time. And at each instant, the arrow has a location, and it's not moving, so the gaps are filled not with motion, but again, with the lack of motion. Aristotle gave another response. So infinity is a sequence of things that potentially can go on forever, but in practice don't. And Aristotle thought the idea of a completed infinity was absurd. So he rejected Zeno's premise that durations of time can be composed of an infinite number of indivisible instants, or nows. But Zeno might reply, let's assume instead that time is composed of a finite number of indivisible durations of time. You know, there's some smallest amount of duration of time. Now, by assumption, nothing happens in each duration, because the durations cannot be further divided. 
but in each duration the arrow is where it is and it's not where it isn't and therefore is motionless. So in other words, Zeno's paradox arises regardless of whether we consider time to be composed of a finite number of indivisible durations or an infinite number of instants. Another response to Zeno is to accept the force of his argument but conclude that rather than telling us that motion is impossible, it's telling us that reality must not, not, not only consist of what is, but also of what isn't. And this is Hegel's position. So Hegel argues that everything that exists is internally contradictory in the sense of having opposed determinations. And to quote him, he says, contradiction is the principle of all movement and activity. Now, if I state that today is Thursday and Friday, or that one equals one and does not equal one, you'll quite rightly reject what I'm saying as logical nonsense. And that's because a foundational axiom of rationality is a principle of non-contradiction. And some people interpret Hegel as claiming that in order to understand change, we've got to reject that principle. And to be fair, Hegel does occasionally seem to state that an arrow in motion both is and is not where it is. And Engels, in fact, adopted precisely that position in his anti-during. But Zeno might reply, you know, how can we know anything at all if we reject the principle of non-contradiction? So, for instance, let me say, let's say we try to catch the arrow out of the sky. Now, if the arrow both is and is not where it is, then how can we be sure we've really caught it? Because we'd also need to try catching it in all the locations that it isn't. So this response of accepting that logical contradictions exist in reality seems to invite madness. Because motion then becomes possible only at the expense of logic becoming impossible. Another set of responses is to turn to modern physical theories for a solution, quantum mechanics, general relativity. They seem to break some of the common sense assumptions of Zeno's argument. I'm not going to discuss any of those, just out of um, interest of, of time. Maybe we can talk about them in the um, discussion. So a popular response, the popular philosophical response, uh, contemporary response, is associated with Bertrand Russell, and it's to accept that there cannot be motion in instance. Motion just consists of being at different locations at different times, and nothing more. And this is uh, often called the at-at response. So in case you missed that, I want to repeat it. So this at-at response asserts that at every instant, the arrow is not moving, but it also asserts that at different times, the arrow is indeed at different locations, and therefore it is moving. So the difference between an arrow at rest and an arrow in flight can only be detected by examining what's happening at nearby instants. So the idea is that motion is intrinsically a relational property. And that sounds quite sophisticated. But Zeno would reply, if motion is a relation between at least two instants of time, then it's necessarily absent in every single instant, which is precisely the point I'm making. So the at-at response actually just restates his paradox with a kind of philosophical gloss. So, so far all those responses are, are unsuccessful, um, I would say. And that's the beauty of Zeno's argument. It's surprisingly hard to solve, which suggests that it might be trying to tell us something fundamental. Um, Aristotle gave another response, which I think begins to make progress. He suggested that Although the arrow lacks motion in any instant, it nonetheless has the potential to move. In other words, the arrow in flight has a causal power, a potential, a power, the power of moving, which an arrow at rest lacks. This power doesn't manifest in an instant because any power requires time to be exercised. Yet in any instant, the power exists unexercised as a potential. And the arrow, therefore, is always where it is, but it's potentially where it is not. 
And in fact, Aristotle's approach uh, dominated the medieval period. Uh, the scholastics, for example, explain motion by the action of a hidden power. They often called it impetus. But these impetus theories of motion were typically informal, expressed in natural language. But the invention of the calculus by Newton and Leibniz in the 17th century, it changed all that. Because for the first time, motion could be understood in formal mathematical terms. So let's now turn to the early calculus and examine how it's constructed. But we'll see that far from resolving Zeno's paradox, it actually reproduced it in a, in a new and more acute form. So the calculus, even today, is the predominant mathematical theory of change. Einstein, writing in 1934, he stated that Newton's calculus was, begin quote, perhaps the greatest advance in thought that a single individual was ever privileged to make, end quote. And um, you, you really can't underestimate the enormous impact on science of the, of the calculus. And today the majority of scientific theories are expressed in, as differential equations, which is a calculus. So how does the calculus explain motion? Let's begin, and I'm going <clears> to <throat> draw your attention to this part of the handout here. It's the graph and the thing to the right of it. We're going to start with the at-at description of, of, of an arrow in flight. So for simplicity, we're going to ignore the actual horizontal motion of the arrow in flight and just look at its vertical motion as it falls with gravity, like that. <laughs> Of gravity. And so at any instant of time t, which is the x-axis there, the arrow is at a location x from its starting point, which is the y-axis there, right? So, and that, that curve, its motion, is described by the equation x as a function of t, i.e. the distance moved as a function of t is t squared. Um, and that means, you know, at a certain time, say 40, it is at a certain location, a uh, distance away from it, it, where it's dropped from its initial took. Um, so the curve isn't a straight line. It, it gets steeper because the arrow obviously accelerates with gravity. In other words, its velocity is changing. But what is the arrow's velocity? You know, we, This is the motion, but what is the underlying velocity? And to answer this question, the pioneers of calculus started by considering a short duration of time. And we're going to call that delta, which is the triangle symbol, uh, delta seconds. And let's say delta is small. Let's say it's 0.1 seconds. We're going to sit, consider a short duration of time of the, of the motion of the arrow. And we want to consider any instant as well, which we'll label t. It could be 20, 40, 60 seconds, or anything in between. But we're going to call it t, so we're going to... Um, we're going to um, argue over all possible instants of time. So we can calculate the arrow's average velocity in a duration starting at time t and ending a short time later at time t plus delta, where delta is our duration, 0.1 seconds, right? And obviously, the average velocity is distance moved divided by the duration of time in which that distance was moved. Right? That will give you average velocity. And on the right-hand side here, you can see it's a bit small, but I've got that equation. Average velocity equals um, the ratio of those two things. And then you can just do some simple algebra, algebra to plug in the distance moved, which would be its location at time t plus delta minus its location at time t, which gives the distance moved, divided by delta. And then because... Um, the equation of motion is, is t squared. You can just do some algebra and simplify it, which is straightforward in that uh, thing on the right-hand side. And um, we get the average velocity. And um, we see that that average velocity simplifies to the expression 2t plus delta. That's the average velocity. So whenever, whatever choice of t, Ever choice of delta, that 2t plus delta will give us the average velocity. The average velocity. Not its velocity at any time. It's velocity over duration of time, delta. So then the pioneers of calculus said, let's assume that that duration delta becomes infinitely small. In fact, so small, so small as we can possibly imagine. And let's call this infinitely small magnitude an infinitesimal. 
It's so small, in fact, that it's effectively zero. So we can ignore it. So then they said, therefore, the instantaneous velocity, the velocity at a time t, becomes 2t. Just throw away that delta. And they called that final expression with the infinitesimals removed. By the way, this is a simple special case, right? This, is, this reasoning will apply to more complex situations, but this is very the simplest case. <clears throat> it, they um, called that final 2t the derivative because it's derived from the apparent motion of the arrow or any body for that matter. 2t is the derivative of t squared. And obviously that means as time increases, the instantaneous velocity also increases because it's accelerating. So if you study the calculus at school, you might remember that the rule for the derivative of x to the power of n is n times x to the power of n minus 1. And what we've just done is a special case of that general rule. So differentiation is the general procedure of deducing the underlying principle of motion from an at-at description. And the derivative in the context of classical mechanics is the instantaneous velocity, which is the underlying principle of motion yeah, for that arrow falling with gravity. <clears throat> and this method worked. In fact, it kicked off a scientific revolution. But there was a problem because the method was logically contradictory. Because at the end of the calculation, we set the duration delta to zero. But at the start, we assume that delta was not zero, that delta shouldn't or couldn't have two different values. And in fact, if we return to our, the original equation for um, average velocity, I want to, I don't have a whiteboard, and <laughs> it's quite small, but if you look at this equation here, um, that one, if you uh, just make delta zero at that point in the derivation, right, you'll see that the top becomes zero and the bottom becomes zero, and you get zero divided by zero. So if we consistently assume delta zero from the beginning, we get nonsense, delta zero divided by zero, undefined. It's a useless equation, it goes nowhere, certainly doesn't equal 2t. So the pioneers of calculus were trying to have their cake and eat it. They began by calculating calculating an average velocity over duration, and then at the end they changed their mind and declared that the original duration was not a duration at all, but it was actually an instant. It's, it's nonsense. So Newton and Leibniz were in the uncomfortable position of having a method that worked incredibly well in practice, but it was founded on a logical contradiction. Bishop Berkeley, writing in 1734, famously satirized all this, quote, they are neither finite quantities nor quantities infinitely small, nor yet nothing. May we not call them the ghosts of departed quantities? End, end quote. So it just wasn't clear what these infinitesimals were, whether they should be considered substantial or insubstantial, even how to multiply them with ordinary magnitudes. And Zeno, if he'd been around, I think, would have had a laugh, because for all the mathematical machinery, the calculus of the 17th century had reproduced his paradox. Motion was now possible only because a duration of time could simultaneously be an instant of time. So a logically consistent foundation for the calculus had to wait until the 19th century when mathematicians such as Cauchy and Weierstrass nailed down a very important, very important, but very subtle concept. And that concept is the limit of an infinite sequence. So, if to illustrate this, let's return to the expression for average velocity. Distance moved over duration of time. Um, so it's x t plus delta minus x t, all divided by delta. Um, we can't assume delta is zero at any point in the calculation. So, these later mathematicians took a different approach. So, let's just imagine, if I draw your attention to this table on the, on the handout, let's imagine we start with delta, a short duration of time, let's consider even shorter duration of time, delta divided by 2. And we can calculate the average velocity over this shorter duration, do the calculations, and it turns out to be 2t plus delta over 2. Fine. Now let's consider an even shorter duration, say delta over 4, and that's the second um, 
column in, 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 that, in that table. And we can recompute and we get another expression for the average velocity in this shorter duration. And let's keep halving it. Let's just, you know, shorter and shorter durations. And we, and, and we can keep going, at least in our imagination, and we get an infinite sequence. So here we've got column one, two, dot, 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 n. And the n is the nth halving. And that duration is getting smaller and smaller. The computation of average velocity is slightly different. We're getting a different number for average velocity, depending on where we choose t to begin. Um, OK, so every halving of this duration, we are getting closer to the concept of a durationless instant. And when Newton and Leibniz set delta to zero, they were in, in effect assuming that this infinite sequence could be completed. And so they were proposing this final column here, if you draw your attention to it, the completed infinity column. That's what Newton and Leibniz, Leibniz were doing. And if you remember, um, Aristotle rejected the idea of complete infinity as absurd, and, and we've just seen that absurdity when you try and think of the infinite sequence as being completed. N can never be infinity. Infinity is not a number. You can't complete that sequence. So instead of completing the infinite sequence, these 19th century mathematicians viewed the sequence as a, a complete object, as a, as a, a complete thing, just one that happens to never be possibly completed. It's subtle, but they're now thinking of it as, as an infinite sequence. Not a sequence that completes, no, just a sequence that's infinite. Um, now, as we saw, the average velocity simplifies to 2t plus delta, but by repeatedly halving durations, which we've just done, we get this sequence of average velocities. And in fact, the nth halving will give um, this expression here, for the average velocity, which is 2t plus delta divided by 2 to the power of n. It doesn't really matter. It's just getting, um, we, we have a sequence of average velocities over shorter durations that are kind of getting closer and closer to what may be the instantaneous velocity in, a, in an instant. Now, um, I'll try and be quick here, but try, now we're going to play a game, right? So I claim that there's some number, let's call it L, for limit, which, which this sequence of average velocities can get as close to as we want. But you are going to be my adversary, and you can win the game if you can prove me wrong, if you can prove that this sequence cannot get arbitrarily close to a limit L. So let's begin the game. I say for this sequence of average velocities, the limit of the sequence is 2t. <laughs> and you want to make my life really difficult, so you say, OK, get within epsilon of this limit, and you choose epsilon to be really small, let's say you choose epsilon to be 0 0.001. So get that close to 2t. And I think for a bit, like, oh, yes, well, actually the 10th number in the sequence, if you work it out, is less than epsilon 0 0.001 away from 2t. So I win that round. So you go, OK, it's your turn again. Make it really hard, OK. Get with an epsilon. Let's make epsilon 1 times 10 to the minus 1,000. That's... That's an incredibly small number, an imaginably small number. Get as close as you can to 2t. And I think for a bit, I'll go, oh. the 3,322nd element in that sequence is actually with an epsilon of 2t. And in fact, this is a simple case of working out limits, but I will never lose the game, because no matter how small you choose your epsilon as the adversary, I can find the nth, an nth element in that sequence where its average velocity is less than that epsilon away from 2t. And it's actually, I can, you can prove it. And so you must concede and agree that 2t is indeed the limit of this infinite sequence. And that game just dramatizes the formal definition of a limit, which I don't necessarily say, which is at the bottom of the page, the definition of a limit, mathematical definition at the bottom there. It's... Um, yeah, when you first encounter it, actually, it's a bit of a, um, it's a bit hard to wrap your head around the definition. It's quite subtle. Um, but um, that is the limit of a sequence. And if you can find the limit of the sequence, then... So, uh, sorry, for, for arbitrary sequences, it can be quite hard to prove the limit of a sequence. But in this case, it's really, it's really straightforward. Now, but for our purposes, it's the concept that matters. And the concept's quite subtle. We're not saying that the sequence eventually becomes 2T because that's false. The infinite sequence never ends. It has no final value. And in fact, the limiting value L is not in the infinite sequence. It's, just, it's not there at all. 
Instead, we're saying that in virtue of the rule or the law that generates the sequence, we can deduce that it must get arbitrary clo arbitrarily close to 2t. And that's the meaning of a limit. The infinite sequence is limited by this value. It never reaches it or goes beyond it. It's limited by it. And in an important sense, the infinite sequence as an infinite object implies the existence of something else, which is its limit. So you might be thinking, well, that's all very interesting, but how does this avoid the logical problem of infinitesimals? And, well, in, in this approach, we no longer assume that delta is non-zero and then becomes zero. Instead, we consistently treat delta as a, non, as a, as a duration. And we ask, what is this limit of, of the infinite sequence of average velocities? As we consider shorter and shorter, limit is 2t. That's the same answer as before, but the method we got there is, is very different. And not only is it logically consistent, but this method handles much more complex cases, even pathological cases. You know, it really works. It gets rid of all those logical problems. The velocity, the instantaneous velocity, is the limit of a sequence of average velocities as we consider s small and smaller durations. So we complete the table in, in a conceptually different way. Average velocity exists over durations of time. We can make the duration as infinitely small as we wish. It implies the exist existence of something else, something different from it, namely uh, what's called in most physics textbooks these days an instantaneous velocity, which is the derivative of the motion which exists in instants of time. It exists by implication through this argument of limits. And the 19th century mathematicians, using this concept of the limit, they solved the problems of the calculus. Calculus is a really powerful tool for all kinds of things. Um, we can start not just with the motion of the arrow and then um, deduce its instantaneous velocity. We could start with its instantaneous velocity, 2t, and then ask what motion would we see, which would be this t squared trajectory. And that reverse procedure is called integration, reverse of differentiation. Um, draw your attention to this diagram uh, here on the handout, which just shows the relationship between uh, differentiation and integration in a simple way. It's a reverse procedure. So the, the standard response, the standard contemporary response to Zeno inspired by the success of the calculus and its foundations um, based on the limit concept, is that Zeno was mistaken in supposing that the concept of an instantaneous velocity must be a logical contradiction. And so for the purposes of, of mathematics and the pragmatic success of mechanics, Zeno's paradox of motion is solved. Physicists don't typically care about it at all. However, um, I don't think Zeno would be satisfied still because I think he, he would raise some objections. I don't think he would object to the mathematics, but the, the interpretation of the mathematics. So let's just uh, step through that. Velocity, conceptually, is a rate of change, but there cannot be change in an instant of time for the simple reason that there's no time for anything to change. So this idea of an instantaneous velocity is an oxymoron. It's a literal contradiction in terms when you think about it. And uh, when I was taught physics and they told me that, I couldn't get over. I've got a very literal mind and I couldn't get over this idea of an instantaneous velocity. No. Now, it might just be poor terminology or it might indicate some deeper lack of understanding. And there's another problem. An arrow in flight now has two velocities. It has an average velocity over durations and an instantaneous velocity at instants. Yet those two velocities are never equal because in our example, the instantaneous velocity is 2t. The average velocity over any duration, however small, is 2t plus delta, and they don't equal each other at all. And therefore the arrow's actual velocity, actual average velocity, actual manifest velocity never equals its instantaneous velocity. And so, according to this interpretation, the arrow in flight has a velocity that it never has, it never manifests. And on the face of it, that seems odd. Um, the standard view 
accepts that nothing moves in an instant. Okay? So no velocity measuring device, stopwatch, speedometer, um, radar gun, doesn't matter how accurate that device could be, we could never ever in principle measure an instantaneous velocity. Because velocity is distance moved over a duration of time. So Zeno might raise another objection, which is that this instantaneous velocity can't be real. Because if it's real, then we should be able to give some account of how we might, in principle, measure it, rather than simply suppose it exists. So standard view interprets a derivative as an instantaneous velocity that is a contradiction in terms, that's an accelerating or decelerating body never manifests, and which does not refer to any property of reality that, in principle, can be measured. So Zeno might point out that we've explained motion in terms of a necessarily non-existent thing, at which point he would probably laugh even more because a non-existent thing is an illusion, and that was his point all along. So the situation, really surprisingly, isn't very satisfactory even today. It's like, you know, two, over 2,000 years later. <laughs> Um, so scientists express dynamic laws in terms of the calculus, hardly concern themselves with the philosophical issues. Philosophers do continue to debate these issues, Zeno's paradox, because there are problems with the standard view, some of which I've mentioned, some of which are, are less well understood. Uh, part of the problem is that most 20th century philosophy adopted a broadly empiricist, Humean outlook. So Hume, for instance, argued that powers, Aristotelian powers, because the potentials, and because they can only become real in their effects and can't be directly observed, therefore, let's be sceptical about that. They don't exist. So causal powers were viewed as archaic occult properties, a kind of redundant Aristotelian animism, right? So Bertrand Russell, in 1903, wrote this paragraph, which I think is, is great. Um, it's inadvertently funny. Russell wrote, Motion consists merely in the occupation of different places at different times. There is no transition from place to place, no consecutive moment or consecutive position, no such thing as a velocity, except in the sense of a real number, which is the limit of a certain set of quotients. <laughs> and end of. So, you know, he was struggling with it too. Uh, he rejected velocity as a, as a real thing. He thought the derivative applied to physics, useful theoretical fiction, mathematical idealization. Useful in practice, but no ontological status whatsoever. We could talk more about that, but we won't. Uh, right, so can we, um, can we uh, make some progress in, in resolving Zeno's paradox in a, in a, in a, in a different way? Uh, so I'm going to sketch a response to Zeno's paradox. Um, and I'll, uh, and I'll, I'll try and be as brief as I can. I want to pay closer attention to what the mathematics is really trying to tell us. And the idea of an infinite limit uh, was a refinement of the much older idea, the method of exhaustion, which is a geometric, not an algebraic method. So we can easily calculate the area of a square because it has straight sides. What about the area of a circle? That was problematic um, before we solved it. The circle has no sides at all. So I'll draw attention to a diagram here. I hand it with the circles. So Archimedes, around 250 BC, he had a great idea of drawing a square within the circle and a square outside the circle. You can calculate the area of those two squares and therefore the area of the circle must be somewhere in between. But there's an error, right? Obviously, it's a, it's a, it's, there's an interval. There's two areas. The circle area is somewhere in between them. So we can make the error less by thinking of polygons with more sides. And as you can see in the diagram, the more sides we have, the closer it gets to a circle. We exhaust the error. <clears throat> Now, Archimedes, I think he stopped at the octagon because that was giving him a good enough approximation. But with the idea of an infinite limit, we can go further and completely exhaust the error. And the it happen just so happens that the limit of an infinite sequence of n-sided polygons is a circle with no sides at all. And when we take the limit of that sequence, limit of the area, the, the limit of the sequence of areas of those polygons of increasing sides... You get a perfect measure of, of the circle's area. We do that mathematically. And as before, the limit's not in the infinite sequence. Instead, the existence of a circle with no sides is implied by the entire infinite sequence of 
n-sided polygons with n n sides. And this geometrical example makes it particularly vivid that an infinite limit is a qualitatively new kind of thing. Because if it was the same kind of thing, it would necessarily appear in an infinite sequence of such things. So, if we apply that analogously to the infinite sequence of average velocities, then the mathematics of limits is, 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 is saying to us that the limit can't be a velocity at all. It has to be a qualitatively new kind of thing altogether. And if we're so inclined, inclined we could say that beyond some limit, quantity changes into quality. So if the derivative is not any kind of velocity at all, then, then what is it? And we can answer that by digging slightly deeper into the relationship between the derivative and the motion. So, um, as mentioned, integration is the reverse of differentiation. So we can... In the interest of time, I'm going to compress this slightly. So, what we can do is, if I draw attention to this here, we can start with, um, this is like a very dumbed-down differential equation. The derivative of the motion arrow was 2t, which we discussed earlier, right? And with some simple, simple approximate reasoning, which I won't go through, we can divide, derive this expression here at the bottom, which says... The position of the arrow at time t plus delta equals the position of the time before at t, its previous location, plus an increment which is 2 times t times delta. That follows from the um, concept of derivative. And so what we've got there is um, a way to numerically solve, num sorry, numerically integrate the differential equation because we can start with x, if you look at the right-hand side just, just here, um, x0 equals 0, say at time 0, the distance moved is 0, just there, sorry, and we, then we can work out the time and say, say that we choose a delta of, of 1 second, we can work out the time uh, when the arrow at uh, time t equals 1 by plugging in the pass value and feed it back in, and we can just cycle forward, and I draw your attention now to these graphs here. And this is where I'm using that numerical approximation to integrate the motion from the, from the instantaneous velocity to get the apparent motion. First graph is delta equals 25. It's a quite a big step size. And the actual motion, the t squared, is that gray smooth line. The numerical approximation is a dotted line. And you can see it's close, but it's quite off. But as we reduce the step sizes, i.e. reducing delta again, we get better and better approximations to the true motion. So what is my point there? Uh, in essence, we're simulating the motion of the arrow by numerical integration. These discrete steps approximate the arrow's continuous motion. And what's important for us to notice is that this numerical method uh, can be graphed as this kind of little feedback loop here uh, on the page. Uh, where the output of the previous step becomes the input for the next step. Okay. I risked that slightly, I hope that's okay. <clears throat> so when we start with the instantaneous velocity, the differential equation, and numerically integrate in, this, in, in that way, we can begin to see that what we've got really is a, a differential system, expressed mathematically, but it really refers to a, a causal structure that connects the derivative to the variable it controls. It connects the derivative 2t to the actual motion of the arrow as it moves through time and space. And in terms of the arrow in flight, this equation represents the causal link between gravity and the arrow. This causal structure, this linkage between gravity and the arrow, it exists in every instant, but when we simulate it numerically on a computer, or like I just did by hand here, or when it simulates in reality, so to speak, it becomes a process that causes motion. In other words, the calculus, the differential equation, captures a causal structure that exists in reality, which has a power, which is the power to move the arrow. And viewing the mathematics of differential equations in this way, suggests a different interpretation of the meaning of the derivative. 
that avoids those contradictions of the standard interpretation. So a causal power exists in each instant without exercising its power because powers require time to act. Now the derivative as a component of this structure represents a potential, a potential, not an instantaneous velocity. And this power, as it acts over durations of time, causes the potential velocity to manifest as an actual average velocity. So an instantaneous velocity is a contradiction in terms, but a potential velocity is not, because a potential velocity is not actually a velocity at all. It's a velocity that, in a sense, doesn't exist, and I'll expand on that in a moment. We also saw that for accelerating or decelerating bodies, the instantaneous, the, the average velocity that manifests never equaled that instantaneous velocity. They're always different. Uh, so the arrow in flight seemed to have a, a velocity that it never has, which was, a contra which was odd. But we can now understand why that has to be the case, because when this causal power acts, it simultaneously changes both the potential and actual velocity. And in consequence, the arrow's potential velocity always differs from its actual velocity, and that's precisely why it accelerates as it falls, because its actual velocity always mismatches the potential velocity it should have. And that potential velocity is always greater than its actual velocity. Um, so if potential velocity um, isn't a velocity, what, what kind of thing is it? Well, one way of thinking about it is that it represents a counterfactual velocity. It's the velocity that would manifest if the causal power stopped acting. Because if that power stopped acting, then the arrow would immediately begin to fall with a constant velocity rather than accelerate. Precisely because in that case, its potential and actual velocity would be equal. And um, for those who think more geometrically, basically, um, it's if you're falling, and if it stopped acting, it would just be the tangent line, uh, which is another interpretation of instantaneous velocity. Um, and we know, uh, and the final thing was that instantaneous velocity was illusory because it couldn't, even in principle, be measured. That was sort of conceptually it couldn't be measured if it's instantaneous. So Zeno questioned whether it was real at all. And now we can explain that too because potential velocity represents represents a velocity, but it's not itself a velocity. It's a qualitatively, qualitatively different kind of thing. So we can't and shouldn't expect velocity measuring devices to detect it. But that doesn't mean that we need to be skeptical of its existence, as Hume was, because we can detect it in different ways. And how we do so depends on what potential velocity really ultimately is, um, physically that is. So just as an example, according to general relativity, the arrow's fall is governed by the curvature of, of space-time. That's why it falls. And that curvature isn't a velocity. It can't be measured by a stopwatch, speedometer, radar gun. We need different kinds of equipment because it's a qualitatively different kind of thing to measure the curvature of space-time and get to grips with what the potential velocity really is. So this interpretation, um, I suggest, is consistent with the mathematics, avoids logical contradictions of the standard interpretation, and it's quite natural. This differential system represents causal power. In our example, the power to cause motion. And the derivative within that structure is a potential, not an instantaneous velocity. Right, so let me um, conclude. So we asked, um, and there's, there's more to say here, and I look forward to what, what we might discuss, but um, just to seed some things. We asked at the beginning how motion is possible. And the answer, I think, is hiding in the mathematics of the calculus, which is our most successful theory of change. Scientific laws almost always express the differential systems. A differential system describes a causal structure with the power to control something. And that causal structure is, is a kind of feedback loop that changes what it controls, and therefore what it controls changes. That's what a structure does, right? It's controlling some other thing, some other part of itself. So the derivative as a component of that loop represents a potential that doesn't exist. 
and then the causal structure, when it exercises its power, brings that potential into actual existence. So, how, how is motion logically possible? It's logically possible because, one, reality can form these kind of control loops, where, two, a component within that structure, a component A, represents the non-existence of the state of another component B, and then the causal structure of the loop is such that B comes to have the state that A represents. Uh, putting that another way, although the arrow in flight is where it is and is not where it is not, as Zeno pointed out, it's also potentially where it is not, as Aristotle pointed out. So motion is possible because reality can represent potential existence, the non-existence of something, and act such that potential becomes reality. And I actually think this is a Hegelian solution to Zeno's paradox in, in disguise. There's, um, there's some quotes uh, from Hegel and Engels at the, at the back of the sheet. But it's, be, it's been refined, I think, by the mathematics of the calculus. So those who are, know um, Hegel's terminology, um, we could restate what I just said using his concepts. The entire system constitutes a dialectical unity of opposites. The derivative is a moment within this unity, symbolizing non-being or nothingness. The control variable, the thing that is controlled, the actual motion of the arrow, is another moment symbolizing being, something that does exist. Being and non-being are in real contradiction with each other. They each vanish into each other. Uh, non-being becomes being, and being becomes non-being in that control loop um, which I pointed out. So the system is therefore self-negating, not in a strictly logical sense, but in the sense of having the power to change itself, considered as, as a unity, right? So this negation is itself negated again and again repeatedly, and this real contradiction resolves itself into a process of change over time or becoming. Um, more could be said there to map those concepts to the, uh, the mathematics. And according to Plato, existence is nothing but the power to produce or undergo change. And Hegel argues in the science of logic that everything that exists must be a contradictory unity of being and nothing. And Hegel and Marx, they devoted um, considerable attention, Hegel, hundreds of pages, Marx, hundreds of pages, to the philosophical implications of the calculus because they saw deep parallels to the Hegelian dialectic. So if we agree with Engels that, uh, begin quote, dialectics is nothing more than the science of the general laws of motion and development of nature, human society and thought, end quote, then I think that the calculus, when, we, when it's properly interpreted, is, is a mathematical formalization of the dialectical theory of change. In a sense, the Hegelian dialectics has been hiding in plain sight in the mathematics of the calculus, because every differential equation is a real contradiction in the Hegelian sense. I'll stop there. Sorry for taking a bit too long. Thank you very much. And any questions that the speaker can answer briefly? I don't know if it's a short question properly, but it, it's really a question why so many people uh, think that the calculus does solve the Zeno's paradox. Um, they think it solves it uh, mainly because of the um, huge successes of mathematical physics. It completely works. Like classical mechanics is hugely successful. Um, and um, in that sense, why worry? Um, but for those that do worry, then typically the answer is, well, Zeno was just wrong. Uh, you can have, you can, conceptually, you can have instantaneous velocity. Um, and, and then wave hands the concept of uh, math, uh, Cauchy via Strauss limits that solve the problem conception. But the kind of people who say that who haven't really, really, really dug into either the mathematics of limits 
or Zeno's philosophical argument. So it's a bit superficial, basically. Yeah, I've got a... I'm going to try to answer this as a short question, but it might just be that I missed a step in the argument. Um, that the potential motion or the causal power, um, you, define the, you define the potential velocity as something like the velocity that it, that it would have if the causal power ceased to operate. So it ceases to accelerate and it falls steadily. But how have we slid into the problem being acceleration when the problem in Zeno was motion at all? Um, and if it keeps falling at a steady speed... The original Zeno problem is not about an arrow that changes speed. It's about an arrow that moves at all. That's my question. Yeah, it's, it's a good question. So the reason that um, <laughs> there is a good answer to this, but let me just collect my thoughts. Um, I'm not, I don't know, I'm going to give you a very satisfactory answer. Um, uniform motion, i.e. a body neither accelerating or decelerating, um, is essentially no motion at all depending on your reference frame. Um, at least in classical mechanics. Uh, there's always a reference frame, right? Um, and... And because, in a special case, a uniform motion, average velocity is identically instantaneous velocity. Doesn't matter what duration, big or small, it's a perfect straight line. There's no problem here. The problems don't arise, okay, mathematically at least speaking. So the whole foundation of calculus was nonlinear curve. You know, it's curves. Curves were the problem. So, and here we're not answering the question, we're not really answering the question, why do things move at all? It's more like, how is it possible? And you might say, well, I would say that by thinking about non-uniform motion, the, the answer I'm giving takes care of all cases. It's just that the, the problem isn't very acute when it comes to uniform motion. Uniform motion, because there's no distinction between. Any other questions? I mean, also, Ian did kind of cover himself when he said that we're going to ignore the horizontal motion of the arrow, which is the which is uh, which has got a which is a component that. Um, that is uniform velocity, and he was kind of just. Um, oh yeah, I mean, so what I'm saying is that it didn't actually. Uh, the, 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 this distinction didn't suddenly appear. It was kind of right at the very beginning. I think Ian did actually. I, I think it's a fair say qu- that. No, I think it's a fair question. Oh yeah, yeah, no. I'm not I mean, saying it, that. it sounds as though we're moving into into discussion. Yeah. Um, unless anybody has any. Um, has any other. Genuine questions, which mine probably wasn't. But um, if not, then we will open it up to general discussion. Yeah. Is, it's sort of halfway. Is, should we think of it being possible for there to be such a thing as a, an instant? It seems to me that actually you're description, what we get out of the, one of the things we get out of the calculus is that there is no such thing as, uh, that, that time is not quantized. There is no such thing as a moment in time. There is nothing in existence except uh, things which are in process and which therefore involve period, periods of time. 
um, so that we imagine uh, the existence of something called the present. But the reality is we imagine the existence of something called the present because our perception works on the assumption that the immediate past will be continued in the immediate future. But in reality, there ain't any such thing. The, um, it's just an expectation about the short-term future. Um, but that's a... Uh, I don't think that makes a difference to you. Doesn't make, I'm not sure that it makes that much difference to your argument, but it helps, I guess, with the fact that you can't get beyond the limit. The, the limit is something that it doesn't exist in... in the form of the uh, um, velocities over actual time. I'll come in for the end. Thank you. Um, very interesting. Um, interesting. Very interesting. Very cool. um, I suppose in one way, Zeno has been an enormously effective propagandist or thinker or whatever you might. And as you said, the fact that we're still discussing discussing his paradoxes now. And in another sense, it's been totally ineffective. Because my impression is that Zeno was a hard Parmenidean. And the point of these paradoxes was not for their own sake, but was a, an, a talking point for Parmenides. That Parmenides' worldview sounds completely nuts. <coughs> that there is, no, there is no motion, there is no change, there is a... everything is... A timeless and indivisible sphere, and it only appears as though there are different things that move, um, and so on. And Zeno, uh, my impression is, is saying that with, with this paradox and with other related paradoxes, oh, we, you think this is bad? Look at what your common sense picture of the world leads to. You get into just as much problems and just as much contradictions. So actually, you should give Parmenides a proper look. And for that, it's been totally ineffective. Nobody puzzles about Zeno's paradox. It's actually, you know what, there is just being. Parmenides was onto something, after all. Um, and I suppose the counter-argument to... What, so far as I know, neither Parmenides nor Zeno has any attempt, or makes any attempt, to show how the world as they take it to be appears, or even to whom it appears, the way it does. And why is this such a radical? And what we think we're observing is motion, and so on. Um, what is the really that we think is us with changing and moving bodies and lives? And what it, what's really, go, well, nothing's going on. What is, it, what is it about this undifferentiated, unmoving world of being that creates the illusion? Um, and I don't, think, I don't think any of these paradoxes help you to, towards any of towards any of that. Um, uh, I suspect if Zeno were around now, I don't think he'd be too bothered by, by the calculus. I think he'd be one of these annoying people who dig out bits of quantum physics. They look see non-locality. That's what I've been saying, non-locality. <laughs> um, uh, but, but no, very interesting very interesting talk. Um, 
I suppose the only other, at least George Thompson is good enough for me, um, dates Parmenides after Heraclitus and thinks that Heraclitus is kind of dialectical. Um, uh, that Parmenides is a conscious rejection of the dialectical common sense of the old Ionian aristocrats. And Parmenides is coming along and, and saying, no, we don't want any of that. Um, uh, but I'll, before I just ramble completely, I'll let other people come in. Anybody else want to? Yeah. <coughs> yeah. Um, I, I must admit, with uh, with, with, with calculus, I've always uh, ju just used the mathematical techniques without really thinking about the philosophical implications. But there are times when, in my teaching, the philosophical implications have kind of come up, and I've um, I, I suppose I've never really explored them. But with um, but, but students ask questions, and I kind of just. Um, and I, I, I kind of just sort of gloss over the uh, <coughs> gloss over the kind of questions that you have. So, uh, and this relates to the question that Ed actually asked: that when when um, I talk about um, a, a body moving with uniform velocity, there's never any there's never any um, problem with there's never ever any distinction to be made between instantaneous velocity or velocity over any period of time at all, if it's moving with uniform velocity, if it's 10 metres per second, um, you just say it's moving at 10 metres per second over that period of time. You don't really say that at this particular instant it's moving at 10 metres per second. Um, and at this particular instant it was also moving at 10 metres per second. Although, in fact, now that I say it, I recall having said that kind of thing, which... Um, Maybe I shouldn't have done so glibly, but when something is accelerating, the velocity is changing. Then it's um that then the concept does become quite difficult to explain. And I, the way that I normally explain it is just um, well, imagine you, you consider a very very short period of time, which doesn't really explain the explain the um instantaneous velocity at all. I say just uh, imagine you imagine a, you consider a very short period of time. I mean, even on a graph where I talk about drawing a tangent, I say, well, imagine that you've got um, just at this particular point, you've got two points really close together, and you draw a straight line um, joining those two points and extend it. Or you just take this tiny section of the curve that's so short that it looks virtually like a straight line, and you extend it in both directions. And so which kind of just um, is kind of sort of um, dodges the whole argument at all. Um, so yeah, no, I, thought it was a, I thought it was a fantastic, uh, very stimulating talk. I, I, I appreciate it greatly and I'll probably listen to it again on your website. But yeah, no, I, I, I do find these things um, not. It's not only the case that I find it difficult. Uh, I find them difficult to explain. Um, it's uh, it's the kind of thing where it's the kind of thing where if you don't think about it too deeply, you can kind of um, convince yourself that it just makes perfect sense. But then, if you start thinking about it very deeply. It doesn't quite. Um, the, the the whole uh, yeah, I mean the, the the whole limit of an infinite series thing. Like uh, uh, again, working out the gradient of a tangent, for example, you um, take the point on the curve where you want the where you where you want the where you want the tangent to be drawn, and you imagine a point a bit further away from further up the curve, and imagine a straight line. And the gradient of that is going to approximate to the gradient of the tangent. But then you imagine um, moving the second point closer and closer to the original point. And, um, and then you can see that the gradient of the series of straight lines that you get approaches what the gradient of the tangent is going to be. 
But then when the second point is it right on top of the first point, you can kind of predict where the limit is going to go. You can kind of predict the limit, or at least you can guess at the limit. I mean, if it's um, 4 and then 2 and then... Sorry, 4 and then 2 and then... Well, no, 4 and then 2.5 and then 2.1 and then 2.001 and then 2.00001. You can kind of uh, visualise that when it gets that the actual tangent is going to have a gradient of 2, but then all the meaning of it gets lost completely when you imagine a second point on top of the first point. I suppose it's a way of getting some kind of meaning out of division, out of division by zero in specific cases. Anybody else? No, as people have been saying, it's really fascinating. Um, yeah, so another point, um, which is, uh, it's not really so, I mean, the fact of the matter is that as, uh, as um, our knowledge of reality has evolved um, in terms of physics, um, it does seem that uh, as time goes, well, that compared to um, compared to some time ago, uh, before before the uh, before the twentieth century, say, um, reality does appear to be a lot more fuzzy at the microscopic scale than it used to be. I mean, so uh, you, so so matter is composed of. Um, um, uh, of atoms, for example, obviously you can subdivide you can subdivide them further. But the material substances that we're familiar with are composed of atoms and molecules, and so you can't. If you have a lump of coal, you can't just keep dividing it and chop it in half and chop it in half and chop it in half and just get smaller and smaller lumps of coal. There is going to be a limit to it, and then you also have. Um, you, you, you also have uh, constraints on on what we can measure because there's an uncertainty at the uh, at the very microscopic level. You can't um, the, the the act of actually measuring something changes it. Um, so the, there's the uncertainty principle. That's uh, one of the what, what one of the um, developments in twentieth century physics. And so, so it may it, it may well be the case that there's a, that, that that kind of fuzziness exists in relation to time as well. Um, and so, talking about an instant may or may not be a you know it, it may be as um, it may be as kind of irrelevant as or it, it may be as misplaced as talking about an infinitesimally tiny lump of coal which um which you can't have because as a you, you can have an atom of carbon you can't get anything small you can't get a lump of coal smaller than an atom of carbon so there may be some kind of fuzziness associated with with time i guess that um not exactly resolves the paradoxes but um but but yeah anyway I think the original Greek atomic theory, and I suppose defer on this to Marx, who did his doctorate about that, but I think part of the appeal of it was that it kind of reconciled the Parmenidean system. That a, an atom is a little undifferentiated, indivisible, pure being, Parmenidean one. Mm. And so if you've got... But you can keep some of the appearances of reality as it seems to be. By saying instead of there just being one of them, but there are lots of there are lots of little ones. Um, anybody else want to, to come in? There's a sense though in which guys play with general relativity. You referred to um, it's the geometry of space-time which makes the, the, the thing appear to move. 
but then the geometry of once we resolve the apparent appearance of movement into the geometry of space time, we've actually abolished movement um, because all that there is is space time. It's like the spinning disk paradox. Anything to do with that? Don't think it's, it's it's to do with that. It's simply that once we say space time is an entity, then it's a part entity in one. Uh, 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 we merely, uh, it's merely a, a, a misperception on our part that we know uh, we are enormously long worms in time, as it were, which pass through the, the, the spaces of time, uh, uh, time and space, uh, as, as, as a, a single entity. Uh, I think that's sort of there's a, there's a bearing of this stuff on. Um, oh God! Uh, it, <laughs> my understanding is that part of the point of the method of marginalism is that it allows you to do uh, comparative statics uh, that you can do then differential calculus. On, you can give an appearance of a process of change, which isn't in fact a process of change because, like the general relativity, it's all. Um, the, the, so the, the, it's the, there's a sense in which the idea is that the calculus is what makes it possible for some anything to be scientific. If you can't express it in, cal in differential calculus terms, then it can't be a scientific statement. Uh, Anybody else want to come happens. in before I ask Ian to reply? There is still time for one or two more. Um, but if, if not, um, then thank you again, Ian, um, and thanks everybody for, for coming along. Next week we will be back here, not necessarily in this room, but in this building, uh, as we always say. Um, when the topic will be basic principles of the internal combustion engine. Um, so, uh, who says we don't address practical real world <laughs> questions in the CCS? Um, uh, so, that will be next week, 7.30. Um, I think that's it for announcements. Uh, Ian, anything that you'd like to reply to from the, from the discussion? Uh, yeah, there's loads of, I'd like to reply to. Um, and um, yeah, I find this fascinating too. So I could talk about it for too long, I imagine. Um, so, I, I, but I won't be able to talk about everything. So I'll just focus on some things. <clears throat> so Parmenides, 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 help me out with this. Parmenides, Parmenides, Parmenides. Yeah. So Zeno was, um, I think, his adopted son, um, perhaps. Some people suggested lovers, and um, yes, he was. Um, his arguments were in service of Parmenides' metaphysics, which was expressed in a poem, which we haven't got all of it. It was in three parts, I think, and the the middle part is um, quite mystical, where the goddess reveals. Uh, all is illusion and really everything's an unchanging one as you mentioned the third part of his poem is is the one we have the least bits on and that's the bit where he supposedly then shows how the illusions of mortals can be generated illusions of change and all that kind of stuff can be generated from this but, so it, it may be he gave an argument but we've lost it but then he, he might not have and um, uh, I think Parmenides, Parmenides would be very happy with um, Einstein's theory of relativity, as you mentioned, Mike, because uh, if you take everything it says at face value, then it is a, it's a block world, right? It's a 4D space-time block world where time is just another geometric coordinate. And so all time exists all at once. Uh, nothing really changes unless you're an observer, with, unless you're within the space-time and uh, have a trajectory in it, and then from your local point of view, things look like they're changing. 
Um, um, so he might be quite quite pleased with that. Um, but of course, general theory of relativity and the idea that motion, uh, that gravity is caused by curvature of space time. That's our current theory. It's not the end of the story, I'm, I'm, I'm sure. Um, and in fact, general relativity does question the idea whether there could be a single objective notion of, of now, which is shared amongst all observers. Uh, that kind of breaks down in general relativity. People can't agree on the order of events in general. Uh, anyhow, um, <coughs> Hegel made your point, Ed, in that quote I gave here, which I really love, actually. It's worth reading multiple times. Hegel's terminology is really kind of, kind of like um, tricky, but once you get a feel for it, um, it's really quite subtle. And, and what he's saying is that, um, well, in, the, in this, this paragraph, he's saying that things that exist must be a unity of being in nothing, I, it must be becoming. Everything's always becoming, right? It's always it's always changing, right? And so Zeno's paradox essentially um, arises because we're looking at becoming. This is the last line in that paragraph. We're looking at becoming only in the form of one of its moments, which is being. In other words, he's saying. The whole, all the paradoxes arises because we're looking at this arrow flying through the air only in terms of its its apparent motion, right? It, it's what it's being as it appears as it appears to us, um, but really, in his terminology, that's not the whole system. There's nothing. There's negativity. There's absence in that system too, which I'm calling potential, right? Uh, he might too actually. Um, there's a representation of nothing in that system, of something that does not exist yet. And, um, and once we see the whole system, then the paradoxes vanish. Um, um, and, um, and he's making your point because I think he actually, when he, when he talks about, he's, he's written a um, history of philosophy and he, he talks about all the Greek philosophers and... Um, he criticizes uh, criticizes Zeno you know, and Parmenides for not being because he's saying it's not sufficient to say um, appearance is illusory. You've got to explain how it uh, how it appears, how it necessarily appears, how the underlying essence necessarily appears. So, which I think was what you were saying, and yes, you do. And Zeno and Parmenides seemingly don't don't do that. Uh, on the other side, the skeptical arguments are really important to. Um, push us to, to, to think things through and, and in that sense they do a great service. Back to your first question, um, you know, one of Newton's laws, the three laws of motion, one of them is that um, a body moving uniformly will continue moving uniformly unless an external force acts upon it. And so in, in that, obviously, the mathematics of the calculus is more general than classical mechanics, right? It applies to all kinds of situations, including situations where there's no actual physical motion, but like um, torsion and stress within substances. Um, but in, in this context, um, you could argue that um, because um, no force is acting on the body, no change is occurring. And uniform motion in this context is something that isn't really changing. Um, <clears throat> Teaching the calculus, I had real, real problems uh, learning the calculus at school. Um, it took me ages to, um, well, I don't think I fully understood it until I really sort of wrote this. <laughs> <laughs> but I've used it all the time. You know, everyone uses it all the time. But um, I had terrible problems with it because of precisely the things you mentioned as a teacher, which is, it's a, there's a, in the way it's taught, it's a sleight of hand. Mm. It's yeah. not really getting to grips with the underlying thing. And, and, and kids, including me, sort of, your mind rebels, which is, okay, you're drawing this cord on a slope and then you bring the two ends of the cord closer and closer together and until they're on top of each other and then you have a, tan have a tangent. What? <laughs> <laughs> no, you have zero divided by zero. 
<laughs> and you just gloss over that and it confuses everybody. Everyone struggles with the calculus. The inventors of the calculus struggled with the calculus, um, which just shows how difficult it is to um, really understand um, the, the logic of change. Um, um, something I didn't talk about, but I think is kind of interesting, is again, um, I, I, I can't get into it now, but to me the calculus shows the need for like a depth ontology. You have, you have curves, you have motion, mathematical curves, mathematical motion, uh, you have equations, and the calculus allows you to infer something hidden or implied by, an, by a motion to something underneath it, the derivative, right? Or the second derivative, the third derivative, the fourth derivative. The, the structure underneath what's apparent. And um, Hume, dead against all that kind of stuff, very skeptical about it. Um, and his famous problem of in induction is that you can't really deduce the existence of invariant enduring laws that generate visible phenomena because all you've got is the phenomena and tomorrow the phenomena might change and any law you've got is purely hypothetical. The interesting thing about the mathematics of the calculus is that speaking loosely by taking infinite limits you're essentially exhausting all possible empirical observations empirical observations of the motion or the curve whatever you know, ideally, mathematically, you are looking at everything, you're exhausting any possible past, future or present that could contradict the underlying law or essence that you deduce mathematically. And that's why it has um, logical validity, you, you know, because in practice we can't do an infinite number of experiments for all time. In mathematics you can and I think the calculus and the, the need, why we're talking about infinite sequences in the calculus to understand change is precisely because we are logically deducing the existence of something hidden beneath something for uh, an appearance. Um, so um, I'm going to stop now, but one thing that I um, think is important about the, the talk is this one idea, which is the representation of non-existence in reality, how some parts of reality can represent the non-existence of the state of another part of reality. And I think that, that that's important about how change is possible. There's something to say, actually, in Roy Baskers' book.